Aloha! Welcome to our program on stroke. My name is Dr. Violet Horvath, and I'm the director of the Pacific Disability Center, John A. Burns School of Medicine, University of Hawaii at Manoa. This program is made possible by the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry Project. Funding for the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry Project is provided by the Hawaii State Department of Health, Developmental Disabilities Division, Community Resources Branch. Mahalo to them for their support. So, what is the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry Project? Well, it's a statewide voluntary registry for residents of any age who have experienced any neurotrauma injury, whether it be a stroke, brain injury or concussion, or a spinal cord injury. During this program, we'll tell you about how stroke affects the people of Hawaii, what are the risk factors for having a stroke, the different types of stroke, stroke symptoms, recovery from stroke, and prevention. There's even a quiz you can take that tests your knowledge about strokes. Well, I took the quiz and got 17 out of 20 right. Take the quiz after watching this program and see if you can beat my score. Now, before we begin, I'd like to introduce our two presenters. Mari Nakamura is project coordinator for the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry Project, and Sean Cho is a Master of Social Work student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Myron B. Thompson School of Social Work. He is currently engaged in a practicum at the Pacific Disability Center. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Stroke is now the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. While the rates are going down, stroke is still a significant issue in terms of the toll it takes on individuals, families, and society. On average, someone has a stroke every 40 seconds, and someone dies from a stroke every four minutes. Stroke is a significant cause of disability, especially for those aged 65 and over, in 2010, stroke accounted for $444 billion in health care costs, medications, and lost productivity. Did you know, in Hawaii, stroke is a leading cause of debilitating disabilities? In 2008 in Hawaii, nearly 3,000 people died from heart attacks and strokes. Heart attacks and strokes are the most common form of cardiovascular disease, or CVD. And there are over 18,000 hospitalizations each year due to CVD, and it accounts for about 22% of all hospital costs in Hawaii. The good news is cardiovascular disease is preventable. A stroke is also known as a brain attack. Just like there are heart attacks, strokes are brain attacks. Now, I'd like to reintroduce the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry Project Coordinator, Mari Nakamura, who will tell you more about strokes. Behaviors and stroke. Eating a diet high in fats and sugars is risky. Sitting for long periods of time at a desk job, watching television or videos is another. Muscles that help blood flow to all parts of your body aren't being used. Your body cells aren't receiving enough oxygen and nutrients. Smoking is a third behavior that increases risk by two to four times. Your body has healthy and unhealthy molecules or free radicals. Free radicals are missing an electron and steal from healthy molecules. Smoking just increases more free, free radicals in your body. Conditions for stroke. Aging is something you cannot really control. If you are lucky, you get to grow old. According to the Centers on Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, the chances of having a stroke approximately double every 10 years after age 55. CDC statistics for 2011 show that 41.3% of persons aged 65 to 77 sustain strokes. Surprisingly, CDC also reports that 30% of people hospitalized for stroke were under 65. Strokes are happening to people in their 50s, 40s, even 30s and 20s now. Gender is a second condition for stroke. 
The National Stroke Association reports that 55,000 more women than men will have a stroke this year. Since women live longer, more women experience strokes as they age. CDC reports that women of all ages are also more likely to die from stroke. With age, recovery from stroke becomes more difficult. Pregnancy and birth control use also bring additional stroke risks for women. Ethnicity is a third condition for stroke. According to the National Stroke Association, African Americans have twice the risk and are more likely to die than Caucasians. CDC reports that Hispanics are less at risk than African Americans, but more at risk than Caucasians. American Indians and Native Alaskans are 2.4 times more likely to experience strokes than Caucasians. Asian Americans are 20% more likely to suffer strokes than Caucasians. Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are four times more likely to die from stroke than Hispanics and Caucasians. Risk factors. The biggest risk factor for stroke is high blood pressure, HBP or hypertension. HBP results from the pressure of your blood against vessel walls as the blood flows throughout your body. HBP overstretches and injures the vessels. This leads to scarring that can trap debris, blocking blood flow, or breaks that cause leakage. The second risk factor for stroke is high levels of bad cholesterol. This is a type of sticky fat found in blood. Trans fats, fats that turn solid at room temperature, produce bad cholesterol. Small clumps can stick together and form bigger clumps, blocking blood flow. Your body produces good cholesterol that can remove the bad, scrub vessel walls clean, or take the bad to the liver for reprocessing. Good cholesterol may also act as a lubricant to stop the bad from sticking together. Obesity is another risk for stroke. High blood pressure, lots of bad cholesterol in your body, and diabetes are often found in people who are obese. You already know that diabetes has to do with too much sugar. Glucose or sugar is a nutrient for your body's cells. Insulin helps transport glucose to these cells, but if you are diabetic, your body doesn't allow insulin to do its work. Poor blood flow results. High blood pressure or hypertension. High blood pressure and plaque buildup from bad cholesterol can cause abnormal heart arrhythm or arrhythmia. This means that the blood flow is not even and steady. It's either too fast or too slow. If too fast, it can cause cardiac arrest. If too slow, your body is not getting enough oxygen. Dizziness, even unconsciousness, fatigue, shortness of breath, and injury to your cells can result. The most common type of arrhythmia is atrial fibrillation or AFib for short. AFib increases the risk of stroke from clotting by five times. AFib is responsible for 15 to 20 percent of strokes by clotting. Stroke is a brain attack. In a stroke, the brain does not get enough oxygen through the blood supply. The result is that brain cells die. According to National Stroke Association, 2 million brain cells die every minute during a stroke. This video gives a good idea of how blood transport the oxygen needed to the brain. This is happening in your brain right now. The heart pumps blood to the brain. Blood carries oxygen needed by brain cells. Blood travels to the brain via the cerebral vessels. Arrow is pointing to the left middle cerebral artery or MCA. Example of cerebral vessels. Arrow is pointing to the left internal carotid artery. The middle cerebral artery supplies the lateral portion of the brain and the deeper structures of the brain such as the caudate nucleus, the tamen, and the internal capsule. The orange in the video shows the left and right caudate nuclei. Now the orange indicates the putamen. 
These are responsible for pain sensation and movement. Enlarged cross-section of a vessel in the brain. The yellow shows the neuron or brain cell. Arrow is pointing to the red blood cell. Green indicates oxygen. Brain cells need oxygen and nutrients to function and survive. Stroke by clotting, ischemic stroke. The most common type of stroke is by clotting. Blood flow to the brain is blocked by clumps of fatty deposits or plaque in blood vessel linings. About 87% of all strokes are strokes by clotting. The graphic in this slide shows a clump of plaque from bad cholesterol blocking blood flow at the point when a larger blood vessel separates into two smaller vessels. Stroke by vessels breaking or hemorrhagic stroke. A second type of stroke is caused by the blood vessels breaking or bursting. The walls of the blood vessels stretched or weakened by high blood pressure can break, causing leaking. A balloon or aneurysm can form in a weakened blood vessel and burst because of HBP. The graphic in this slide shows ballooning, breaking, and leaking. Transient ischemic attack or TIA. Transient ischemic attack or TIA is a mini stroke caused by temporary blood clots. The graphic shows the little orange clumps of plaque that stop blood flow at the point when a larger blood vessel divides into two smaller ones. The clumps of plaque are small enough to break up eventually and pass through the smaller blood vessels. A TIA or mini stroke is a warning stroke. About a third of persons having TIAs go on to experience strokes within one year of the TIAs. People may not even notice that they are having TIAs since they may not last long and people return to normal functioning rather quickly. People may also have many TIAs without noticing. Strokes and heart attacks often occur together or one after the other. Hospital records document that you can have more than one stroke or heart attack or a combination of both, sometimes within a short period of time. The normal functioning of both brain and heart depend on regular, consistent blood flow. It makes sense that disruption of blood flow would affect either or both organs. Heart attack versus stroke. In a heart attack, the heart doesn't get enough oxygen and blood. Pain results. The heart muscle dies. In a stroke, the brain doesn't get enough oxygenated blood. Brain cells die. Five common stroke symptoms. Stroke symptoms occur suddenly. The emphasis is on suddenly. There is no warning. Symptom one is numbness or weakness in the face, arms or legs, especially on one side of the body. Symptom two is confusion. You may have trouble speaking or understanding others when spoken to. Symptom three is trouble seeing either in one or both eyes. Double vision is common. Symptom four is dizziness. Trouble walking, loss of balance, loss of coordination. Symptom five is severe headache with no known cause. Stroke symptoms may differ from the five most common ones, more so for women. Women can experience pain in their limbs or face. Hiccups, uh, they may feel that something is just not right. It'll be serious enough for them to go to the ER. FAST. The American Stroke Association uses the letters FAST as an easy way to remember what usually happens during a stroke. F stands for face. One side of the face may droop. A stands for arm. The arm on one side may be weak or even immovable. S stands for speech. You may not be able to speak coherently or at all. You may not understand what someone is saying to you. T stands for time. Call 911 immediately. Don't drive yourself to ER. Emergency crews can prep you and save time. Get to a hospital as fast as you can. For a stroke, time is of the essence. Did you know about TPA? TPA stands for Tissue Plasmogen Activator. TPA treatment in Hawaii. T 
TPA is used as a treatment for strokes by clotting. TPA thins clots or unclots. However, treatment needs to be within three hours of a stroke. You need to know when the stroke began. You need to take into consideration the time needed to transport to a medical facility. The medical facility must test and evaluate to determine if benefits outweigh the risks. The benefit is that TPA can help 30% of persons with stroke by clotting. The risk is that TPA may increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, stroke by breaking or bursting of blood vessels. In Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands Regional Stroke Network can provide access to TPA treatment through telemedicine. Teleconferencing between specialists at Queens and doctors in rural or neighbor islands can help stroke patients without taking time to transport them. Sean Cho will continue with stroke recovery. Stroke effects and recovery. In this section, we'll go over how stroke affects people, rehabilitation and recovery, going home, and preventing strokes. How stroke affects people. Strokes affect the body, mind, and feelings. Each stroke is different. The effects depend upon the part of the brain that is injured, how bad the injury is, and the person's general health. The first way it affects people is through weakness or paralysis. This weakness or paralysis is on one side of the body. This may affect the whole side or just the arm or the leg. Problems with balance or coordination. These can make it hard for the person to sit, stand, or walk, even if the muscles are strong enough. Problems using language. A person with aphasia may have trouble understanding speech or writing, or the person may understand but may not be able to think of the words to speak or write. A person with dysarthria knows the right words but has trouble saying them clearly. Being unaware or ignoring things on one side of the body. Often the person will not turn to look toward the weaker side or even eat food from the half of the plate on that side. Pain, numbness, or odd sensations. These can make it hard for the person to relax and feel comfortable. Problems with memory, thinking, attention, or learning. A person may have trouble with many mental activities or just a few. For example, the person may have trouble following directions or may not be able to keep track of the date or time. Being unaware of the effects of the stroke. A person may show, show poor judgment by trying to do things that are unsafe as a result of the stroke. Trouble swallowing. This can make it hard for the person to get enough food. Also, care must sometimes be taken to prevent the person from breathing in food while trying to swallow. Problems with bowel, bladder, and the control. These problems can be helped with the use of portable urinals, bedpans, and other toileting devices. Getting tired very quickly. Becoming tired very quickly may limit the person's participation and performance in a rehabilitation program. Sudden bursts of emotion, such as laughing, crying, or anger. These emotions may indicate that the person needs help, understanding, and support in adjusting to the new effects of the stroke. Depression. This is common in people who have had strokes. It can begin soon after the stroke or many weeks later, and family members often notice it first. Depression after a stroke. It is normal for a stroke survivor to feel sad over the problems caused by the stroke. However, some people experience a major depressive disorder, which should be diagnosed and treated as soon as possible. A person with a major depressive disorder has a number of symptoms nearly every day, all day, for at least two weeks. These always include at least one of the following, feeling sad, blue, or down, and having a loss of interest in things that the person used to enjoy. A person may also have other physical or psychological symptoms, including feeling slowed down or restless and unable to sit still, feeling worthless or guilty, increase or decrease in appetite or weight, problems concentrating, thinking, remembering, or making decisions, or trouble sleeping or sleeping too much having a loss of energy or feeling tired all the time. They may also have headaches, other aches and pains, digestive problems, sexual problems, feeling pessimistic or hopeless, being anxious or worried, and having thoughts of death or suicide. If a stroke survivor has symptoms of depression, especially thoughts of death or suicide, professional help is needed right away. 
Once a depression is properly treated, these, thought, these thoughts should go away. Depression can be treated with medication, psychotherapy, or both. If it is not treated, it can cause needless suffering and also make it harder for recovery from the stroke. Disabilities after a stroke. A disability is a difficulty doing something that is a normal part of daily life. People who have had a stroke may have trouble with many activities that were easy before, such as walking, talking, and taking care of activities of daily living. These include basic tasks such as bathing, dressing, eating, and using the toilet, as well as more complex, complex tasks called instrumental activities of daily living. These include housekeeping, using the telephone, driving, and writing checks. Some disabilities are obvious right after the stroke. Others may not be noticed until the person is back home and trying to do something for the first time since the stroke. Rehabilitation helps stroke survivors relearn skills that are lost when part of their brain is damaged. Rehabilitation also teaches survivors new ways of performing tasks to circumvent or compensate for any residual disabilities. Rehabilitative therapy begins in the acute care hospital after the person's overall condition has been stabilized, often within 24 to 48 hours after the stroke. The first steps involve promoting independent movement because many individuals are paralyzed or seriously weakened. Patients are prompted to change positions frequently while lying in bed and to engage in passive or active range of motion exercises to strengthen their stroke-impaired limbs. Depending on many factors, including the extent of the initial injury, patients may progress from sitting up and being moved between the bed and the chair to standing, bearing their own weight and walking with or without assistance. Beginning to reacquire the ability to carry out these basic activities of daily living represents the first stage in a stroke survivor's return to independence. For some stroke survivors, rehabilitation will be an ongoing process to maintain and refine skills and could involve working with specialists for months or years after the stroke. The process of recovering from a stroke usually includes treatment, spontaneous recovery, rehabilitation, and the return to community living. Because stroke survivors often have complex rehabilitation needs, progress and recovery are different for each person. The first steps include helping the patient survive, preventing another stroke, and taking care of any medical problems. Spontaneous recovery naturally happens most for some people. Soon after the stroke, some abilities that have been lost usually start to come back. This process is quickest during the first few weeks but it is sometimes continuing for a very long time. Rehabilitation is another part of treatment. It helps a person keep abilities and gain back lost abilities to become more independent. The last stage in stroke recovery begins with a person's return to community living after acute care or rehabilitation. This stage can last for a lifetime as a stroke survivor and family learn to live with the effects of the stroke. This may include doing common tasks in new ways or making up for damage to or limits of one part of the body by greater activity of another. Acute care. What happens during acute care? The main purposes of, of acute care are to make sure the patient's condition is caused by a stroke and not by some other medical problem. Determine the type and location of the stroke and how serious it is. Prevent or treat complications such as bowel or bladder problems or pressure ulcers. Prevent another stroke and encourage the patient to move and perform self-care tasks, such as eating and getting out of bed. This is the first step in rehabilitation. Before acute care ends, the patient and family with the hospital staff decide what the next step will be. For many patients, the next step will be to continue to rehabilitation. Some people do not need rehabilitation after a stroke because the stroke was mild or they have fully recovered. Others may be too disabled to participate. However, many patients can be helped by rehabilitation. Hospital staff will help the patient and family decide about rehabilitation and choose the right services or program. There are several types of rehabilitation programs. Hospital programs. These programs can be provided by special rehabilitation hospitals or by rehabilitation units in an acute care hospital. Complete rehabilitation services are available. The patient stays in the hospital during, during the rehabilitation. An organized team of specially trained professionals provide the therapy. Hospital programs are usually more intense than other programs and require more effort from the patient.
nursing facility programs. As in hospital programs, a person stays at the facility during rehabilitation. Nursing facility programs are very different from each other, so it is important to get specific information about each one. Some provide a complete range of rehabilitation services, others provide only limited services. Outpatient programs allow a patient who lives at home to get a full range of services by visiting a hospital outpatient department, outpatient rehabilitation facility, or day hospital program. Home-based programs. The patient can live at home and receive rehabilitation services from visiting professionals. An important advantage of home programs is that patients learn the skills in the same place where they will use them. Individual rehabilitation services. Many stroke survivors do not need a complete range of rehabilitation services. Instead, they may need an individual type of service, such as regular physical therapy or speech therapy. These services are available from outpatient and home care programs. Choosing a rehabilitation program. The doctor and other hospital staff will provide information and advice about rehabilitation programs, but the patient and family make the final choice. The patient and family may have a preference about whether the patient lives at home or at a rehabilitation facility. They may have reasons for preferring one program over another. Their concerns are important and should be discussed with hospital staff. Things to consider when choosing a re rehabilitation program. Does the program provide the services the patient needs? Does it match the patient's abilities or is it too demanding or not demanding enough? What kind of standing does it have in the community for the quality of the program? Is it certified and does it have uh, staff have good credentials? Is it located where family members can easily visit? Does it actively involve the patient and family members in rehabilitation decisions? Does it encourage family members to participate in rehabilitation sessions and practice with the patient? How well are its costs covered by insurance or Medicare? If it is an outpatient or home program, is there someone living at home who can provide care? And if it is an outpatient program, is transportation available? A person may start rehabilitation in one program and later transfer to another. For example, some patients who get tired quickly may start out in a less intense rehabilitation program. After they build up their strength, they are able to transfer to a more intense program. What happens during rehabilitation? In the hospital or nursing facility rehabilitation programs, the patient may spend several hours a day in activities such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, recreational therapy, group activities, and patient and family education. Part of the time is spent relearning skills that the person had before the stroke. Part of it is spent learning new ways to do things that can no longer be done the old way. Rehabilitation goals include being able to walk at least with a walker or cane, being able to take care of oneself with some special equipment, being able to drive a car is, really, is a realistic goal for some, and having a job can be a realistic goal for some people who were working before the stroke. For some, the old job may not be possible, but another job or volunteer activity may be. Reaching treatment goals do not mean the end of recovery. It just means that the stroke survivor and family are ready, ready to continue recovery on their own. Rehabilitation specialists. Because every stroke is different, treatment will be different for each person. Rehabilitation is provided by several types of specially trained professionals. A person may work with any or all of these. A primary physician. Several kinds of doctors with rehabilitation experience may have this role. These include family physicians and internists, geriatricians, neurologists, and psychiatrists. A rehabilitation nurse. Rehabilitation nurses specialize in nursing care for people with disabilities. They provide direct care, educate patients and families, and help the doctor to coordinate care. Physical therapists. They evaluate and treat problems with moving, balance, and coordination. They also teach family members how to help with exercises for the patient and how to help the patient move or walk if needed. Occupational therapists. They provide exercises and practice to help the patient do things they could do before the stroke, such as eating, bathing, dressing, writing, or cooking. Speech-language pathologists help patients get back language skills and learn other ways to communicate. Social workers help patients and families make decisions about rehabilitation and plan their return to the home or a new living place. They help the family answer questions about insurance and other financial issues and can arrange for a variety of support services. 
It may also provide or arrange for patient and family counseling to help cope with any emotional problems. Preparing a living place. Many stroke survivors can return to their own homes after rehabilitation. Others need to live in a place with professional staff such as a nursing home or assisted living facility. An assisted living facility can provide residential living with a full range of services and staff. The choice usually depends on the person's need for care and whether caregivers are available in the home. The stroke survivor needs a living place that supports continuing recovery. It is important to choose a living place that is safe. If the person needs a new place to live, a social worker can help find the best place. During discharge planning, program staff will ask about the home and may also visit it. They may suggest changes to make it safer. These might include changing the rooms around so that a stroke survivor can stay on one floor, moving scatter rug or small pieces of furniture around so that they can prevent falls, and putting grab bars and seats in tubs and showers. It is a good idea for the stroke survivor to go home for a trial visit before discharge. This will help identify problems that need to be discussed or corrected before the patient returns. Preparing caregivers. During discharge planning, talk with staff about caregiving and develop a workable plan. What are the stroke survivor's needs? Who can best help meet each of them? Who will be the main caregiver? Does caregiving need to be scheduled around the caregiver's jobs or other activities? There is time during a discharge planning to talk with program staff about caregiving and to develop a workable plan. It is important to keep notes on discharge plans and instructions and ask about anything that is not clear. Caregivers can help with personal care if the person cannot manage alone, help with communication if the person has speech problems, and include the stroke survivor in any conversations even when the person cannot actively participate. They also arrange for needed community services. In preparing for caregivers, they also help to make sure the stroke survivor takes all prescribed medicines and follows suggestions from program staff about diet, exercise, rest, and other health practices, encourage and help their person to make practice skills learned from rehabilitation, help their person solve problems and discover new ways to do things, help their person with activities performed before the stroke. These could include using tools, buttoning a shirt, household tasks, and leisure, leisure or social activities. Going home to the old home or a new home is a big adjustment. For the stroke survivor, it may be hard to transfer the skills learned during rehabilitation to a new location. Also, more problems caused by the stroke may appear as a person tries to go back to old activities. During this time, the stroke survivor and family learn how the stroke will affect daily life and make the necessary adjustments. These adjustments are a physical and emotional challenge for the main caregiver as well as the stroke survivor. Caregiving that falls too heavily on one person can be very stressful. Even when the family members and friends are nearby and willing to help, conflicts over caregiving can cause stress. A stroke is always stressful for the family, but it is especially hard if one family member is the only caregiver. Much time may be required to meet the needs of a stroke survivor. Therefore, the caregiver needs as much support as possible from others. Working together eases the stress on everyone. Preventing strokes and healthy living. You can help prevent strokes by making healthy lifestyle choices. A healthy lifestyle includes the following. Eating a healthy diet, maintaining a healthy weight, getting enough exercise, not smoking, and limiting alcohol abuse. Healthy diet. Choosing healthy meal and snack options can help you avoid a stroke and its complications. Be sure to eat plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables. Eating foods are low in saturated fats, trans fats, and cholesterol, and also high in fiber, can help prevent high cholesterol. Limiting salt in your diet can also lower your blood pressure. Being overweight or obese increases your risk for stroke. To determine whether your weight is in a healthy range, doctors often calculate your body mass index. If you know your weight and height, you can calculate your own body mass index at the CDC's website. Physical activity can help you maintain a healthy weight and lower your cholesterol and blood pressure levels. For adults, the Surgeon General recommends 2 hours and 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, like brisk walking, bicycling every week. Children and adolescents should get at least 1 hour of physical activity every day. Cigarette smoking greatly increases your risk for stroke. If you don't smoke, don't start. If you do smoke, quitting will lower your risk for a stroke. Your doctor can suggest ways to help you quit. And Limiting alcohol. 
Avoid drinking too much alcohol. This can raise your blood pressure. Men should have no more than two drinks per day and women only one. This last slide shows the Center for Disease Control Stroke Facts brochure as well as a stroke quiz that you can take online. This is Violet Horvath, Director of the Pacific Disability Center. If you or someone you know has had a stroke, brain injury or concussion, or a spinal cord injury, please consider joining the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry. It does not matter when the injury occurred, what age they are, only that they are a resident of Hawaii. We also provide an information referral service for all residents who have had one of these injuries regardless of whether they choose to join the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry or not. The next slide shows our contact information. We welcome your questions and comments about this stroke presentation or the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry project and look forward to connecting with you. Mahalo for attending our program. Music